Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When my husband and I moved internationally and joined in with a community of an international congregation, which as you know, we did several times, one of the privileges that we had is we moved into a furnished apartment. International churches have rented a place for their pastor and the families if you bring family. And we had the good fortune of moving right in, uh, joining into the community, starting work, building relationships, hitting the ground running, and not having to worry about beds, bedding, linens, uh, sofa, table, or kitchen supplies. It was fabulous. You know, and it was really quite an honor to be welcomed like that. The only things that we needed to bring from our home country were, well, clothes, coats, uh, pastoral stoles and robes, uh, maybe a few books and a few photographs of, you know, from home, personal items. So why am I telling you this? Well, in today's gospel lesson, Jesus told the 72 evangelists that he had just appointed not to take anything with them, to leave the house without anything. Can you imagine? Do not take a purse. Where does one put their Kleenex? <laughs> or a bag? Or sandals? You know, even moving into a fully furnished apartment or flat, as they called it, I still brought four suitcases with me, four. And that's after using the Rick Steves method. Do you know Rick Steves? Yeah, the traveler guru and L Lutheran. Hello, he's Lutheran. Where you lay everything out and then you remove half of that, right? So that's even with doing that method, I still ended up with four suitcases. You know, why would Jesus send out these evangelists without any preparations or even a pair of sandals? Well, my thought is, my first thought is that Jesus wanted those being sent to depend on the sender and to depend on those they were being sent to. Jesus sent these pairs out to towns and places where he had yet to go, but he was planning to. He was planning to go to them, and he sent them out with nothing. And I believe that this was to teach them a lesson in dependence, in humility, and in servanthood. Buying to agree, to agree to go with nothing, no wallet, no backpack, no extra clothes or shoes or food or money. They had to really trust Jesus and believe in what he was saying and doing. And they had to be open to trusting the people that they met that these strangers would provide hospitality for them in some manner, offering them food and water and shelter. And they had to learn to depend on one another. Jesus sent them out in pairs, not alone. And I imagine there were times that those pairs enjoyed each other's company and they worked well together. And humans being who we are, I imagine that there were times they couldn't stand each other, right? How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you have a very good friend or a partner or someone that you like being around and there's times you can't stand being around them? But this is all part of their learning of trust and dependence and relationships. And they were learning to be servant leaders. Yes, they were asked to be leaders. They were chosen by Jesus himself. 72 of them handpicked to go ahead of the Christ and prepare the towns and the villages for the coming of Jesus. What an honor this must have been. And surely there was the presence of pride in their hearts. And yet, Jesus did not send them out with the trappings of glory or honor or celebrity status. They weren't sent out like the leaders of their day. They were sent out barefoot, broke, and with no recourse except the graciousness and the hospitality of those whom they met along the way. 
You know, frequently in our thoughts these days are the millions of refugees who have left their homelands and who are making their ways to new places. For months we have seen pictures and we've read stories and heard stories of those fleeing the Ukraine. For years we have worried about those on our southern border. Refugees, people desperate for a new life. Soon after we arrived in Bratislava, Slovakia, we joined a group from the Bratislava International Church who traveled to the austrian hungaria border to offer food to the immigrants who had been let off the train. I've shared the details of this story with you, so many of you know that. Uh, the refugees, so I'm not telling all of that part again. I have a point to this. The refugees then walked, after they were let off the train, they walked a couple of miles towards the border along with the rest of the crowd not knowing which country they were in or which country they were going to. They'd all been herded onto the train with no information and let off the train with no information, not even where they were. Can you imagine? Those with whom we spoke were well-educated, knowing several languages, and their clothes, while now dirty and soaking wet, because of the cold rain pouring down, were a finer quality. At one time, these people had been people of means. And they, were, and they left it all because of fear. Because their homes were destroyed. And they were sure that their lives would soon be destroyed. Some began their trips with provisions. I saw a video of a child who carried his toys from his home, but gradually had to give away or leave behind his most prized possessions either because they were too heavy to carry in the walk, or his mama and his papa couldn't carry him and his toys too, or when they had to move quickly for one reason or another, there was no time to gather up his toys or his little stuffies. And when I think of leaving everything behind, honestly, I think more along the lines of those refugees, that I would leave it all behind because I had to not because I had another choice, and certainly not because Jesus told me to. And yet, that is what we have in the story today. You know, it's so much easier on our pride to be the gallant host rather than the needy guest, right? In the church, we frequently teach and talk about that we as Christians, that we're the heart, hands, feet, and voice of God in this world that we are to act in love for the one who loves the world. And that is most certainly true. We are to help those in need without thought to our own discomfort. But there are times when the Lord wants us to feel discomfort and distress, lest our humility be overshadowed by our pride and by our self-importance. Jesus taught his disciples this when, on the night in which he was betrayed, while well, after eating supper with them, he wrapped a cloth around his waist. He took a bowl of water and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Doing the work of the lowliest servant, he showed the disciple what it meant to be the Christ and what it meant to be a Christ follower. Jesus came not to be a king and not to be a conqueror, but to be the suffering servant. Matthew 20, 28 reads, He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even today, we who follow Christ are called to be servants. Humility is to be greater than our pride. Trusting in God and trusting in one another is to be a higher calling than trusting in ourselves. And when stuff like wallets and bags and clothes and jewelry and jobs and accumulating things gets in the way of our listening and obeying God's call, then we're to cast those aside so we can focus on what God wants us to do. 
A few years ago, again, while overseas, we had the privilege of having three young adult men show up for our weekly Tuesday evening Bible study. We learned their names, Chris, Allie, and Alex, and that they were from London. And, you know, we were so excited. It's always exciting when new people join in a Bible study here in this church as well, too, right? That's always exciting. Honestly, though, I had been prepared to meet them by the Holy Spirit, who used a woman in our congregation to tell me that very morning about the program that sent these three to our city. For this woman's daughter had friends who were being sent to Vienna, Austria, where we had previously lived and served, and they asked if we had any contacts there. Then she explained to me about this program that was sending young adults throughout Europe. The title of the program was Escape and Pray. Sounds fun, doesn't it? It's kind of intriguing. You can still look it up online. It still has the information about it. And it was a movement that took place over a couple of years. 200 teams of young adults were sent out to European cities that had universities. And these young adults, quote, were on a mission. One, to pray for the university. Two, to connect with the local church. And three, to be ready to be used by God. So the young adults were sent out in teams. They showed up, I saw videos of of this. They showed up at the airport, not knowing where they're going and not with a bag or anything. Uh, No money, no credit card, no luggage. And they showed up at the airport and an orange envelope is given to them and they open it and they have the tickets to the city to which they're going. And uh, online you can see and they're cheering about, you know, which city they're going to and they're excited about that. Well, these three opened up theirs, and uh, it was to Bratislava. They had never been to Eastern Europe, much less Slovakia. And so they were so excited. And so when I walked up to the building where the Bible study is, it's called the Lyceum, the old Lyceum, uh, the old school, where we taught Bible study, and I saw their matching T-shirts that say, Escape and Pray, I exclaimed, Oh my gosh! escape and pray, thinking, we have some of them here in Bratislava. And they asked with surprise, you know what this is? And I said, well, I do now. So uh, they were each given 20 euros, put on the plane, and told that for 72 hours, they were to pray for the city of Bratislava. They were to meet young adults and find community. And they found us. They did find lodging at a local monastery and ate dinner with us in our flat on Wednesday evening. And then on Thursday, the next morning, they went with the ELCA teachers to the new Lyceum, the Lutheran High School, and they worked in one of the English-speaking classrooms uh, with Pastor Dominique, who was the intern pastor, and had a lesson prepared on prayer. And they were excited because that's what they were supposed to do. And... um, Pastor Dominique, being an intern pastor, was a little concerned, a little anxious how it would go because, you know, high school students, right? It doesn't matter what culture you're in or what country you're in. They can either be cooperative or not. However, they were very cooperative that day. They immersed themselves into the prayer experiences Pastor Dominique offered. And they resonated with Chris, Allie, and Alex with their enthusiasm, with their sincerity, and sharing their experiences of faith. And the rest of us, well, the rest of us who interacted with these three men were energized also by their enthusiasm and by their stories that they shared, filled with awe, filled with amazement and wonder of God's faithfulness, how God just blessed them and blessed us, and the generosity of God's people. And we were humbled that God allowed us to be part of their story and experience of the greater story of God's ministry throughout the world. And these three prayed for us, prayed for us by name, poured out their blessings on the ministry. That is so powerful. If you've never had someone pray for you, 
let Karin and me know, and we will gladly pray over you right after this service. It's amazing. And we prayed for them as well. In today's gospel lesson, we read that the 72 were to go out and tell people, the kingdom of God came near to you. Whether the people accepted them or turned away from them, they were to share those words, the kingdom of God came near to you. Those of us who met these young men from Escape and Pray felt that the kingdom of God came near to us those 72 hours. Not because of the men's greatness or their athletic prowess or their wealth or their good looks or anything like that, but, but because in their humility they were sent out ready to be used by God. They trusted the sender and they trusted that God's people would provide for them. And because they did, and because we did, we came near the kingdom of God that week. So let me ask you, where is the kingdom of God coming in your life? Where is God calling you this day? Where does the sender want to send you? It doesn't have to be another country, although it might be. It could be in your neighborhood, in your family, among your friends, in your work, in your school. Or maybe God, the sender, is asking you this day to be the receiver and sending someone your way. I invite you to be open, to be humble, to trust, not in yourself, not in your wallet or your portfolio or in your things or not in your job, but trust in God and in God's people. The kingdom of God is near you. It's near us. Will we see it? Will we experience it? I hope so. I pray so for all of us. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Amen.